I want to introduce Adrienne Jones, our guest today. She's a PhD candidate in the Joint Public Policy and Sociology Program at Duke and a 2023-2024 Global Justice and Equity Fellow. Her research examines individuals' experience with employment, both job loss and job changes, and the reproduction of, of social and economic inequalities. Adrienne is particularly interested in the employment experiences of black workers in the American South. Prior to her studies, Adrienne worked in policy research at both Duke University and Mathematica. She holds a Master of Public Policy from the Sanford School at Duke University and a BA in Political Science from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Her talk today is entitled Fee to Drive, How Poverty, Punishment, and, the po and Policy Shape the Lives of Suspended Motorists. Well, um, thank you so much for being here today. Um, so as Erin mentioned, I'm Adrian, and I am a fellow here, um, a Global Justice and Equity Fellow um, for the 23-24 school year. So today I'm going to talk to you about a piece of my dissertation work. Um, so broadly, this work is examining driver's license suspensions and what they mean for the lived experience of um, suspended motorists here in North Carolina. Um, but today I'll be focusing specifically on a piece of this work that's looking at employment outcomes and how driver's license suspensions may matter for some of those. Um, so to set the scene a little bit, uh, monetary sanctions or legal financial obligations are financial punishments that are imposed for a wide range of offenses, including traffic offenses. And these things can be as serious as DUI or DWI offenses or as minor as uh, equipment violations. So thinking of driving with a broken tail light or my tent is too dark or something like that. Um, so in uh, recent decades, there's been a huge increase in the use of monetary sanctions as a punishment. Um, and there are two primary reasons. One, because they are considered a less punitive alternative to incarceration. So this is supposed to be better for people to some degree, right? Uh, it's also viewed as an opportunity for individuals to repair harm. So to be able to exchange money um, uh, to, to make up for some ill that I have caused in the world. Um, but there are some reasons to be concerned about monetary sanctions. Um, we think that monetary sanctions, or, or we know that monetary sanctions, actually have a, a disparate impact. Um, and two reasons that this is the case. One is that black individuals, in particular, are more likely to have police contact and to be sentenced as a result of that police contact. Um, and traffic stops are the most common way that most citizens are interacting with the police on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and then we're also thinking about ability to pay. Um, we know that there are some big kind of income and wealth differences across racial groups, um, and that oftentimes black individuals um, have less access to capital, um, less savings, um, they make uh, less earnings on their jobs that may affect their ability to even satisfy these monetary sanctions in ways that are different from other ethnic and racial groups. And this matters, I think, for a couple of reasons. Um, so 33 states currently permit restricted driving privileges because of outstanding legal debt. And this outstanding legal debt could be the result of outstanding traffic tickets that people have not satisfied. Um, and we know that for um, individuals with low incomes, the inability to access uh, transportation is a significant barrier to employment. Um, so therefore, tying all of these things together, um, there's reason to believe that these monetary sanctions that result from traffic debt um, can disproportionately impact the economic well-being, particularly of people of color. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, so uh, to kind of set up this study, I posed this kind of research question, this broad question around like traffic debt-based driver's license suspensions and how they shape the, the lived experience of suspended drivers. Um, but then uh, underneath that, I really want to think about, like, why do drivers who have their license suspended experience these barriers to employment? Um, to set the context uh, a little bit about where, we're, where the study took place here in North Carolina, and North Carolina is one of the 33 states that suspends driving privileges due to outstanding legal debt, including traffic fines. Um, and the vast majority of folks in North Carolina who have their driver's license suspended have some minor infraction. Um, so general statute 2420.1 is the, the law that is on the books here in North Carolina um, that states that uh, 
uh, we have the right to restrict driving privileges with this outstanding debt. Um, and as of 2021, more than a million North Carolinians had active driver's license suspensions related to having this outstanding debt for some reason or the other. So about 4% of all driving age individuals in Durham County have a suspended driver's license um, due to this outstanding traffic debt. And if we're thinking about the racial implications, um, individuals who identify as Black or African American tend to bear the heaviest burden of North Carolina's driver's license suspension policy. Um, so Black or African American drivers in Durham have a suspension rate that is about five times higher than that of the statewide average um, for uh, suspension rates for white and non-Hispanic drivers um, in Durham County. There we go. So uh, some local governments have been thinking about how to deal with this problem. How do we address racialized inequality and do so through driver's license restoration? Uh, so I'll talk to you a little bit about this intervention, which is the DEER program, the Second Chance Driving Initiative, um, which looked to target uh, the issue of driver's license suspensions here in Durham County. Um, so DEER was actually a community-informed initiative. Um, so the city of Durham held some listening sessions with folks who had been formerly justice involved to better learn about the barriers they were experiencing to employment. Um, and these were largely uh, black individuals, men who had had some form of justice involvement previously. Um, and the thing that they learned from these interviews uh, over and again was that reducing, uh, creating barriers for folks to get their driver's license back was one thing that folks needed to be able to access um, employment. So the program actually offered kind of mass fine and fee relief. Uh, if you had a certain charges that met certain eligibility criteria, um, what the county did was they forgave all of that debt. So you didn't have to uh, talk to an attorney, you didn't have to go to the courthouse. As long as you met the criteria, that debt was forgiven. Now, there are a couple of um, really interesting features of this program design that I think matter for folks' outcome. So this relief happened at the offense level and not at the person level. So I, Adrian, could have any number from zero to infinity of traffic charges, and some of those may have been eligible for relief depending on what they were, and some of them may, may have not been. Um, these traffic offenses had to happen here in Durham County, so Durham County, um, the DEER program did not deal with any traffic issues that were happening um, in other counties, even surrounding counties. Um, and these had to be lower level offenses. So one of the things that was negotiated is that DUIs and DWIs were not part of the deal at all. They only had to be minor kind of traffic infractions. Um, there were also some really interesting kind of marketing challenges that the program faced. Uh, one is that, on average, most folks who had this debt forgiven um, had driver's license suspensions that were about 16 years old, uh, with some of the oldest being around 30, 33 years that folks had had their driver's license suspended. So notification was a problem. A lot of the addresses on record that we had for these folks were not necessarily current. There wasn't good information uh, to get in contact with these people. So it was difficult letting them know that they even received this benefit. Uh, something else uh, that I think is really interesting is about kind of the, the political landscape here in North Carolina. Uh, Durham is a relatively progressive city in, um, you know, a more conservative state. And there was some concern from city government that uh, developing these types of programs and doing these kinds of debt relief initiatives uh, would catch the wind, would catch the ear of folks at the General Assembly and that they would pass legislation to prevent local governments from doing these kinds of things. So there was a low kind of level marketing effort. Uh, they uh, canvassed and handed out flyers, particularly in neighborhoods where folks were likely to be affected by these driver's license suspensions. Um, but there was not a very robust kind of effort um, to get the word out about this program. So lots of folks who actually benefited from the debt relief never knew that they did, and to this day, may still not know. And this is really important because folks are not taking advantage of the benefit that is available to them, and many are still living lives as suspended motorists. 
Um, and one of the really important outcomes that I learned as I've been talking to folks uh, is that there's a real barrier to employment. Um, so thinking a little bit just about what I did, um, I interviewed folks. So I talked to people who were eligible to receive relief from the DEER program um, about their experiences. So uh, we received a database from the city of eligible individuals. These are individuals who knew that they were eligible and, and reached out to make contact with the city. Um, and we, I contacted them by email, phone call, text solicitation, tried to use a variety of methods to, to be able to get folks um, to talk with me. I was ultimately able to conduct 39 interviews. These were all conducted between May 21 and December 21, um, primarily via Zoom and phone call because we were still under kind of COVID protocol, so there wasn't a lot of flexibility to interview folks in person as I normally would. And then on average, these interviews were about 60 minutes or so where we discussed a variety of things, um, but particularly related to employment and travel. We talked about how folks travel from day to day, what transportation options they have available to them, what their experience has been, you know, what did they feel they had missed out on or what did they know they had missed out on. Talked about financial stability, employment disruptions, and so forth. And then from there, um, I took that interview data, coded that interview data to identify big things. So some of the same stuff that folks were saying across a variety of interviews um, to uh, develop some of these findings that I'll show with you today. Uh, and just to tell you a little bit about like who I talked to, um, this is uh, my sample. So I'll just draw your attention to the far left column here. These are the folks that I actually interviewed. What you'll see is by and large, uh, these were black individuals. They were primarily men um, around 44 years old or so. Um, only about 20% had these charges that were ineligible, so DUIs, DWIs, other more serious kind of driving infractions. But most of them kind of fall here into this category, uh, failure to comply, 76%. This is what we're talking about, not paying. Um, so you were issued an order to pay some debt by the court and you failed to comply by paying. Um, so most folks in the sample kind of fall into this category with minor offenses. And really what happened was uh, their inability to pay a debt is what was punished as opposed to their actual driving behavior. Uh, so to preview my findings a little bit, I think one of the things that has been so interesting to learn is that uh, these debt-based driver's license suspensions, they force people to make choices, right? Um, and then one of the choices that we see our, my, my participants making, our suspended drivers, uh, is about their driving behaviors about what they are, how they're going to get around from day to day. So folks in this study largely kind of fall out into one of two categories, either my drivers or my riders. And I focus on how people are getting place to place because this actually matters for what some of their employment outcomes are. Um, as you might guess, our drivers are those who continue to drive after their license has been suspended. Um, and this is largely because they have no other transportation options. They may live in areas uh, where they don't have access to public transportation. They may not have close family or friends or other support networks who can drive them around. They may choose not to rely on those networks for whatever reason. Um, but driving is their kind of primary mode of traveling place to place. Uh, riders, on the other hand, are those folks who uh, tend to rely on what I call alternative forms of transportation. So uh, public buses primarily here, in Durham, rides from family and friends, ride share, those types of things. Um, so to preview my findings, uh, these are the three big uh, outcomes that folks in this study talk about. They either keep their job, lose their job, and it also shapes their attitudes and their behaviors about future work. Uh, so for those who keep their jobs, uh, they largely keep those jobs because they don't have transportation barriers, right? Relatively self-explanatory. So drivers continue to drive, riders have access to, they have access to transportation, but it's important to note that it's also reliable and it's regular. So they are regularly able to get to work or reach whatever destinations they need to for their employment opportunities. 
I think a really important um, mechanism that I did not anticipate was this idea around discretion. This is another way that folks are able to keep their job. So this thing that I've been calling managerial discretion, right? These are choices that employers are making. So not only are the drivers making choices, but others, uh, other stakeholders in the networks are also making choices that affect their employment outcome. Uh, so some managers, right, they make some choices that allow their folks to maintain their job. So maybe they are willing to overlook company policy or company norms uh, that may say you must have this credential to be able to work here, uh, either because it, that it, it, you need it to actually fulfill the role. So maybe I'm a delivery driver, right? Or maybe uh, I'm driving a piece of equipment at a warehouse or something like that. So I need it to be able to do the job or because I prefer it because it signals something to me about you as a person, right? So I did not observe employers, that is important to say. However, I am talking with um, workers about their experience uh, being employed and what they have experienced um, as it relates to their driver's license in their work environment. I think the other thing that was really interesting was just this legal discretion. So some folks talk about having relationships with law enforcement officers in particular. Uh, one woman comes to mind um, who had previously experienced some domestic violence in her marriage um, and had a relationship with an officer who would always respond whenever she had to call 911. So this was someone who patrolled her neighborhood and who was regularly around uh, and she didn't mind driving because she knew this person knew that she was going to work. So they would let her pass. They wouldn't stop her or give her a ticket or anything like that. Um, so folks are having some of these kind of discretionary experiences that allow them to keep their jobs despite what their transportation choices may be. Uh, so one example of this kind of managerial discretion is, is Paul. And Paul is a 46-year-old white man. He's one of the three, I think, that we talked to in the study, but had a really unique experience. Uh, Paul worked as a landscaper. Um, he was also a crew leader. Um, and as a driver, his boss really needed him. So he said last year, his boss actually wrote him a letter to let uh, uh, the DMV know the importance of having his license. Because not everybody knows how to operate the machines the way he does. And he says, you know, he's being patient. And he's like, no, I'm not going to let you go uh, because of one reason. You just want to hold tight and be patient with this process and see it to the end. So. Paul had a skill set that was incredibly valuable and one that his employer felt that he couldn't use. So even though he needed it to operate this piece of equipment and to be able to legally do the job, his, his manager was willing to overlook this because of the skill set that he brought to the table to keep him employed. Um, so there are some folks who keep their jobs but with limited responsibilities, something that I kind of call job ground downgrading. Um, so these are people who are experiencing reduced responsibility um, or pay to, in, to meet employment requirements. Uh, so one example is Teresa, who's a 44-year-old black woman. Um, and Teresa was initially working as a nurse, uh, but part of her job required driving patients to appointments, to pick up medication, back and forth from home. Um, and she wasn't able to do that, unfortunately, without her license. She says, most of my patients I had to take them to their doctor's appointments. So I couldn't do that without a license. It wasn't the thing with the insurance card or the registration. It's just mostly about my license, but it affected me a little bit. So I had to take like a pay grade lower to be a home health person by getting the pay that a home health person would. So she had to take a job that had fewer responsibilities, but it also came with less pay than what she was initially making. And while it may seem like a good thing, that folks are keeping their jobs. Yes, it certainly is. But people are also making trade-offs as well. So for the folks who are, who are driving or who may benefit from this discretion, um, people are trading a bit of job security for, for some kind of additional personal risk. And this primarily affects the drivers. And I'll give you an example of why. So we have Jonathan here, who is a 36-year-old black man who had no other transportation options, so he had to continue driving even after his license was suspended. Um, so he says, I was pulled over one time just for driving with no license. Since he didn't have a license because of a previous DUI, they, give, they gave me 10 days for that, 10 days in jail. So I did 10 days for that, and now I'm back in court again because I got to drive to work, 
so I was pulled over again, and I don't have a license again, so they might try to give me some more days for that. For the folks who aren't aware, driving with a suspended license is actually a criminal charge in North Carolina, so it often comes with um, steeper consequences uh, than some other types of traffic offenses. So, but what Jonathan highlights is that um, Oftentimes, folks who receive this driving with a suspended license are pulled over for some other reason, some minor reason. Um, I think he was actually pulled over because the tent on his car was too dark. But when his license, when the police ran his license, what they found is that his license was suspended. So he actually got the upcharge, which comes with a more expensive ticket, and it also comes with more um, sanctions. Some folks in the study uh, lost their jobs, though, because of their driver's license or their driver's license status. Um, two primary reasons that this happens are, are these kind of workplace practices that I mentioned earlier, and then also this transportation dependence. Um, so these workplace practices, Janice offers a, a good um, excuse for this. She's a 40-year-old black woman who was doing security work. And she lost her job because they found out she didn't have a driver's license. Um, part of her responsibility was driving this company car, patrolling the grounds of the area where she worked. And she legally could not do that anymore after losing her license. And then we have Steven, who is a 38-year-old black man um, who's working at a hospital. He was working as a valet. And he needed his license to be able to do that, to park the cars. So he lost his license uh, due to not being able to legally drive anymore. Um, these workplace practices primarily affect drivers who are in roles where driving is a primary responsibility. Um, for those who ride, largely this transportation dependent. So this piece around kind of unreliable transportation is typically what disrupts employment for these folks. So we have Terry, um, who's a 47-year-old black man uh, who had a really, really interesting story. He said, I used to be an assistant general manager at a big restaurant. Uh, so I worked my way up from the bottom as a dishwasher and a hostess and a cashier into a management role. And once I became a manager, I was promoted to assistant general manager, something I was very proud of. Uh, but not having a driver's license, having to catch the bus to work. The buses were not always on time. That sort of caused me to lose a very good job that I had worked for 13 years. So Terry's a really interesting, um, uh, a really interesting example of this kind of career mobility, right? Of being able to start as an entry level position and work his way up to a managerial role. So something that he was very proud of, but he just couldn't get to work on time. The buses were always unreliable. He could not regularly get to work at a set time every morning. And though it was really difficult for his employers, they ultimately made the decision to, to terminate his employment. Uh, and then finally, some folks talk a little bit about how these experiences have kind of shaped their attitudes and their beliefs about future work. I mean, for most people, they think that the driver's license is a barrier to them um, exploring options in the future. Um, about kind of what individuals are thinking. So what folks are saying uh, broadly is that they have this kind of reluctance to pursue certain types of work. Um, people often feel uh, there are low barriers to entry to, to service work. I can always go to Burger King, I can always go to Walmart, and I can get a job, but I'm not making good money working at these places. If I really want career mobility, if I wanted a professional job of some sort to work in an office, et cetera, I need to have a license to do that. So some people don't even pursue those types of things. So a little bit of kind of self-selection um, because they're making they're making uh, cost-benefit analyses, right? People are thinking, what is worth my time to apply to? What is something that I'm likely going to hear back from that might be um, uh, something I might actually have a shot at getting, right? Um, and then folks also talk about you know, some of their kind of moral commitments. Folks kind of describe this reluctance to commit to work, giving their driver's license status, knowing that they can't regularly get somewhere, either uh, by driving or by riding with folks or relying on public transportation. So it's really important to be able to give their word and to stick to their word. And when they can't do that, they won't commit to opportunities um, as they come to them. So Rashad, who's a 36-year-old black man, kind of talked about his experience at UPS. 
Um, he said, I actually worked at UPS, and they wanted me to be a driver, but my driving record wasn't good enough, and they were paying good money. So he didn't even apply for the opportunity. He knew, he, he knew in his mind, right, that he was going to be denied. But what he was denied from uh, wasn't just this job, right, but also like this opportunity at making more money, at more stability. Gregory. Um, Gregory's a 50-year-old man. Gregory's a locksmith, um, which is really, really interesting. Difficult to get around and open people's doors when you can't freely drive yourself. So even though Gregory has kind of struck out on his own and started his own business, the business isn't really getting up off the ground and he's not pursuing the business, being able to take off or him even being able to venture um, into more profitable opportunities like getting local government contracts to do this kind of work. Um, he said, it all falls back down to my license or whatever. I can't go out and nothing, can't get nowhere. And then I can't pay somebody for a ride if I don't have anything to pay with. I just can't make no money. And then we have Donnie, who's a 49-year-old black man. He said, I had plenty of offers, like second shift work back in those days. The bus had stopped, and that job was until midnight. So I couldn't take it. I went to the orientation and everything, but I couldn't take that job because I had no way home. So even folks for whom they're getting offers, sometimes they're having to turn them down because the transportation options I just don't allow them to be present in the way that they would hope. So all in all, uh, these barriers that driver's license suspensions create keep folks feeling unfulfilled. Many of them describe how they don't feel good about their jobs. I probably shouldn't even use the word jobs. Most of them say they have jobs. They don't have careers, right? They're doing things to make money, um, but these aren't necessarily careers in the way that others may have them. They often feel stuck in this kind of low-wage work and really barred from the careers they would like to pursue. And something that, that I think is very, very interesting, a lot of people mentioned truck driving. We kind of talked about like what would be a dream career, um, and a lot of people talk about truck driving. And it's not, I think what's important about this is not what they would actually have done, right, if they had a driver's license. I think it's more about what this type of career represents to people. Um, truck driving represents a, a good job, right, that we talk about in sociology, so something that is stable, has steady income, benefits, allows them the ability to travel. And I think a lot of folks feel because of their driver's license status, they will never have these good jobs. They will only ever be stuck with what they are, what they are able to get, um, which are oftentimes these jobs um, that aren't allowing them very much uh, career or personal advancement at all. So in sum, uh, these debt-based driving policies really do create hardship in the lives of suspended drivers. Um, many of these hardships revolve around access to uh, maintenance of employment. And these really are unjust punishments, as many of the respondents in my study would say. Um, they can be quite punitive, uh, particularly for those who are unable to pay. And they produce a series of long-lasting and kind of negative consequences in these folks' lives. Um, and I think this is a really important point to, to just reflect on for a little bit. We call these poverty penalties, right? Because if I was able to pay my traffic ticket, none of this would be a problem. If I had the money ever that I felt I could allocate to this, I wouldn't be a person who had their driver's license suspended for 16, 20, or even 30 years. So for a lot of people, this is financial. This is about financial priorities um, and where they are in their lives um, as opposed to their actual driving behavior. I was thinking about some potential implications for policy, because I'm a policy scholar, right? I think the most direct implication is, is striking down the statute, right? The statute that allows for these debt-based driver's license suspensions here in North Carolina um, is the most direct way to resolve some of these issues. But we know that uh, statutory change is really slow to happen. It's not always politically popular. Um, there are lots of stakeholders who have a number of opinions about how and why these things should or should not change. So if I'm looking at uh, left 
better alternatives, right? Then better advertisement of ability to pay solutions. So there are ability to pay solutions in North Carolina, one of which are ability to pay hearings through, through the Division of Motor Vehicles that um, individuals with low income can request. Nobody knows this is a thing. Very few people know this is something that they can request. None of the respondents in my study um, were aware that this was an option available to them. So a few years ago, there was some relaxing of the statutes in North Carolina that allowed for kind of marketing of these ability to pay, um, but there are the same issues. We had marketing with deer. It's really difficult to get in touch with folks, right? Um, uh, through mail, especially. <laughs> that mail is not getting to anyone it's intended for. So thinking about like, how do we better advertise these types of solutions to allow people to take advantage of them? And then I think this is also a story about investment in public transportation, right? Um, for those of us who have been in Durham for, for quite some time, you know, there are buses. They don't go everywhere. They don't get you all the places that they need to. They don't run all day and all night. Um, there are no real other kind of public transportation alternatives. So what does it look like to live in a place where there's been a lack of investment in public transportation and what does starting to think about investment in public transportation um, mean for the lives of these suspended drivers? So I will stop there uh, and I look forward to any questions that you all may have. So there aren't any online yet, but I do have a question. Yes. So, um, and then I'll open it up to everybody. Apologies um, for the three options at the bottom, right? So a lot of the time we talk about what's equal and equitable. Um, so the three options, strike down the law, better marketing, or investment in public transportation. If you were to pick one of those that would be the quickest and most public solution, um, because, you know, if you strike down the law, people might not necessarily know the law has been stricken down. Those that were, you know, affected under the law, you know, statutes, right? So they could still be penalized. It new people wouldn't. Um, marketing, that's an issue everywhere. Um, and then public transportation, getting the right people who control the pocketbook to invest in it. Um, so if you had your dream, which one would you choose? Yeah, if I had my dream, it would be this one. Um, but you, you gave me some parameters. So I'm thinking about quick. It would probably be something like this. Um, there have been conversations in North Carolina about public transportation for years. Those are moving very slow. Uh, striking down statutes is also something that is quite difficult. Uh, so hopefully for my next project, I would love to dive into why these types of laws exist. Um, anyway, uh, so that would be kind of digging through some of the uh, transcripts from assembly sessions hearing about what folks are saying, learning about how folks are talking about these types of laws. Um, one thing that I do know is that oftentimes these are, uh, they are described as being advantageous to public safety, right? We uh, are preventing these lawbreakers from being out on the roads and driving, right? Spoiler alert is not the case. A lot of people still drive, <laughs> whether their driver's license are suspended or not. Um, it's also, it doesn't, compel people to actually pay these debts because many of them literally can't. So the debt is outstanding to the state. Um, so something else like revenue. So like being able to pad like local and state budgets is also uh, something that folks talk about, about why these types of things are even necessary. Uh, but for the folks in this study, the state never recoups this money. Some of these folks have been without their driver's license for almost as long as they've been alive, you know? Um, so. If we're talking about like quick and what we may be able to affect um, soonest, it would probably be things around like advertisement of ability to pay. Um, but this is also kind of riddled with issues too. It's just like, what are the best ways to get in contact with folks? Um, the mail is not it. <laughs> mail is not it. Um, so how, you know, who are we partnering with? Are we thinking about partnering with um, local counties, like local courts, um, are there ways that the DMV could put together, you know, packets uh, that are, that have information that are available to people, uh, you know, how could we get information? Maybe people are getting text messages through their phones, kind of brainstorming things out loud. But I think the advertisement piece would be the, 
the lowest hanging fruit, maybe the quickest thing that we were able to address, but we're, there would really need to be some intention behind it. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Adrian. Very interesting. I have a couple of questions, sure. uh, probably two. One is, could you share a little bit of the mechanics of how one person loses the ability to drive? Mm -hmm. or when the suspension comes, how many tickets for, we don't know. Of, of course, we know that if you are driving or, or on, you know, for the influence of substances, of course, that's, but you are talking about here minor, uh, minor infractions. And something else that came up a few years ago was that countries in the South in particular were exercising um, ways to bring more revenue to their budgets through these kinds of punishment to, to you know, to, to basically through drivers, mm -hmm. right? Uh, by using their local police to create more roadblocks or stops mm -hmm. or whatever. Of course, people that were mostly affected were people that already had some issues with their right driver licenses or people of, of color or minorities that had to be on the road uh, most often that don't have, uh, you know, that right of, of driving that is a, a huge drive in this country. And have you find uh, that here in North Carolina we have, I think uh, Johnson County was one of those counties that, that used that kind of policy of getting more revenue through through ticketing, uh, somebody, some something else around here, but I don't remember, just those two. Yeah, thank you for those questions. Um, so your first question is about like, what are the mechanics of actual driver's license suspension? So what typically happens for uh, folks who fail to pay, um, you, you get stopped, you get a ticket. Uh, on the ticket, it normally includes a variety of information, so like, when you need to go to court, um, if that's required, like when your payment is due, where you can pay, or you know what website you can go to, all of those kinds of things. Once you are found guilty, so to speak, in court of your driving infraction, um, there is a judgment that is entered, and you have a certain number of days to pay whatever the fine or the fee is that is attached to that traffic offense. After a certain number of days, I think it's, it's either 120 days, I have to look specifically. Uh, after that number of days, if this debt has not been paid, then the clerk of the court will basically transmit that information over to the DMV, notifying the DMV of your failure to pay so that they can put you into license suspension or revocation status. Yeah. It could be, it could just be one. Mm -hmm. It could just be one. And then your second question, um, I don't know as much, it's something I'm really interested about, so I don't know as much about specific counties um, that may have kind of like explicit policies around revenue collection. Um, I know this is, a, this is a thing that counties do. I think it is more covert sometimes, like folks aren't necessarily talking about this is our specific intention to do this. Um, but I know that it definitely happens and something that I'm hoping to dig a little bit more into as well. Um, but I know for like here in Durham County, for, for our folks, they, they just are not, they're not getting the money, even if their intention was to pad their budgets. We do have one question online. Um, actually, we have two. Um, they're both from um, Gabrielle. She said, could you address the amount of debt in examples and include interest accrued when someone is unable to pay? Um, and then she followed up with, what is the revenue used for? So I think piggybacking on Miguel's here. Yeah, so I think the, re the uh, generally the revenue goes to like operating budgets, whatever is covered in their operating budget. Um, it's actually really difficult to quantify like how much debt is, um, can be attributed to some of these like traffic tickets. Um, but I do have some kind of anecdotes from folks that I've talked to. Uh, it varies. It can really vary. Um, so some folks have had outstanding debts, you know, as small as 300 or so dollars. Um, and I had one person in the study who had about $19,000 in outstanding debt. So that includes fines, fees that have accumulated over years, any interest, 
any of those types of things. Um, so at least in this study, there has been a wide range of several hundred dollars to several thousands of dollars. The kind of commonality across all folks is that um, they can't pay it. What I will say is with regard to the mass relief, so the, the number of fines and fees that the city waived or kind of forgave for folks who were eligible for this program was around $2.7 million, if that gives you a, a bit of a cumulative figure. But this was only for about 11,000 people, right? That's not everybody who has debt that's owed to the state. Thanks, Adrian. Um, so many questions, but I think I'll um, stick to two if that's okay. Sure. I, I think I heard you say earlier that these um, traffic um, infractions primarily are experienced by black drivers, mm -hmm. at least in Durham County or in, in the state. And just wondering where do brown drivers kind of, and I don't, apologies if you already kind of made that comparison. Yeah, um, no, it's a great question. And one that I get a lot too. So if we're just thinking about like particular like racial groups, right? Um, black people and folks of like Hispanic or Latinx origin are typically overrepresented among these like traffic stops um, and sometimes among the group of folks uh, who are unable to kind of satisfy these debts. So I think it is definitely an issue that spans more ethnic and, and um, racial minoritized groups than just black individuals. There, this was a challenge, like being able to reach like Hispanic and Latinx populations in particular was a real challenge for the city. So most of their uh, marketing and recruitment materials were in English. Um, so there was a real concern there and then kind of identifying like Spanish speaking populations um, was a bit of a challenge as well. So unfortunately, we were not able to um, identify any Spanish-speaking people um, in our study, in our sample, but we know that that is a population of folks for whom this is also a really important issue and hoping that further iterations of this program where we have more tools, right, more language tools, more identification tools um, to, better, to better determine like uh, other groups who are also being affected. Spanish speakers make up a huge percentage of the population yeah. in Durham and in the, yep. in the state. Um, my second question, these, it seems like the kind of severity, if you will, if that's the right word, of what a traffic violation and infraction can be, like swings so huge, yeah. like a DUI, which seems personally kind of like a reasonable thing, you know, if you're driving drunk, but then something, these lesser, especially one that I heard you brought up, uh, the tint is to like, so there's so many questions about that. Like one, why do the lawmakers, I suppose, think that those types of things prevent or, or, or inhibit public safety? And then the other though, I guess I would be, and I don't even know if this is even re, re, um, necessary to think about, but why do people want more tint? I mean, is it an aesthetic thing? And then why are we like kind of like monitoring aesthetics in that sort? So I don't know, just. Yeah. Those are great questions. So I'm really glad you asked the first question. Because, um, you know, why am I glad she asked the first question? I thought, let's, oh, you're talking about like, uh, just like the severity of kind of punishment, right? So it's really funny. In North Carolina, a, a uh, license suspension because you didn't pay your traffic debt for a lot of folks actually ends up being more punitive than the punishment for a DUI or a DWI. And I'll tell you why. So, um, the, the punishment for a DUI or a DWI is laid out very clearly. You lose your license for exactly one year, right? And then if you are on your best behavior, you don't have any more driving infractions, you fulfill whatever obligations that you're required to, it could, it's probably like you need to go to class, have to stay sober, like whatever the requirements are. One year, you can get your license back. These suspensions are indefinite until you can come up with the money to pay for them, and most people cannot. So they last much, much, much longer, um, which I think magnifies the consequences of these types of things for these honestly minor traffic offenses, as opposed to like more serious things like DUIs and DWIs. Um, so why is this related to public safety? So I think this has to do 
Yeah, so I'm actually working on a project now around like public opinion of debt relief for these kinds of things. And something that we know about folks is that when we're thinking about like debt forgiveness, there's a wide range of opinions, right? People are much more likely to want to forgive like medical debt or things like that than they are for criminal debt, right? And I think criminal is a huge catch-all and, and people don't often realize, or legal debt, right? People don't often realize like how many little random things make up that bundle of legal debt. I think oftentimes when we hear legal debt, what people are assuming is that it's like criminal or unlawful behavior. People are doing bad things that they should not be doing and therefore they should have to pay this debt. They should be punished, right? Um, but I don't think people always realize that traffic debt is a form of legal debt, right? Um, so I think, I think there's just some kind of notions about what people are doing to incur, incur these types of punishments and um, you know, who we believe deserves support or not. And then to your question about like, can't, I think what it is is it makes it difficult for like law enforcement to see in your car. Um, and you may be in your car doing all kinds of nefarious things. I don't know, you know. <laughs> um, but yeah, so there, there are some like requirements around like how dark the windows can be, how not. Um, and if you're perceived to have like violated those norms, then you can be pulled over and stopped for that. Um, your, your study mostly focused on traffic incidents in North Carolina, yes, you were saying. But did you come across any uh, subject or hear any discussion about those who lose their licenses and ability to work because of out of state, you say 33 states have these laws. Yes, ma'am. Let's say you have a um, failure to pay child support, those kind of obligations. Yep. They're legal, they prevent you from driving in any state, you can't work. Um, have you had any experience with any reports like that? And are there any advocacy groups or anybody thinking about issues like that that equally impair your ability to work? Absolutely. That's, it's a great question. So I haven't had anyone in this study who lost their license somewhere else and then had difficulty in North Carolina. But what we have, um, as I mentioned earlier, so this DEER kind of intervention that was looking to help with driver's license restoration, it only deals with stuff in Durham County. Folks are mobile, right? Folks are mobile, borders are open, people are traveling all over, all over North Carolina. Um, Raleigh-Durham is a big commuter area where there's lots of cross-county travel. So a lot of our folks have tickets, not only in Durham County, but in Orange and Chatham and Wake. Uh, some people like way out in Dare, Pender County. Um, so people, you know, it's really, you gotta drive around here. Um, and people are driving all over the place. So what we actually ran into was that DEER, instead of functioning like a driver's license restoration pro program, all it did was it offered debt relief to folks. It was able to take care of a little bit of their debt that they had incurred here in, in Durham County, but they still had all this outstanding debt in other counties that the program didn't deal with. So that was more of what we saw, and that was still a barrier to folks getting their license back and to employment. Now, we did have some folks who talked about um, trade-offs. So people, we had some, a lot of the guys in the study were fathers and they were um, like non-custodial. So they weren't living in the home with their children. So they're having to make trade-offs because they have child support requirements. And it's like, do I pay this ticket or do I pay my child support? I know my child support might more directly end me up in jail, right? So people are prioritizing those kinds of things or people are working. Uh, one guy, uh, the guy who was at, um, he was the, the general manager at the restaurant who lost his job, making good money as a general manager. He talked a little bit about how he had to go back to working service jobs. He was working three jobs, working about 100 hours a week so he could make his child support and not go to jail. And after a few years, he actually ended up being hospitalized for exhaustion because he had been working so much to try to stay ahead of that child support debt. And he was hospitalized for three months. And he got out and had to start working the same way again. So child support is something that I'm hoping to actually venture into next, thinking a little bit about these restrictions and what they mean for folks who are trying to pay child support. Not clear, not, not clear, but particularly refers to traffic 
Traction. Yes. Okay. Yes. Just just traffic. Mm -hmm. Just traffic, but it has all of these spillover effects into lots of different areas of life. Exactly. Exactly. We have one more online if nobody in here has any. Um, and you may or may not have this in for, oh, I'll get you next. Yep. Um, what is the percentage of collection of fines? Ooh, that's a great question. I actually don't know, but that is something I would like to know more about. Mm hmm know if a suspended license can be used for voter ID? Oh, so ah, this is a really great question. I don't know. Um, I don't know. My, my instinct is a lot of places do just a visual inspection of the ID. So if people have it, so once it's suspended, not everybody is required to surrender it or like turn it in. A lot of people are still able to keep it. So for places that do a visual inspection, there's no kind of marking on it that the license is suspended. So people still may, may be able to use it in that way. As things start to become more automated though, I know a lot more places are scanning IDs and so forth. That may be more of a challenge. Mm -hmm. Great question. <laughs> Sorry, can I, um, I really liked Aaron's first question about your, um, what in your ideal world, which one would you tackle first? And just thinking about the ability to pay and what you just described as when someone receives a ticket, like that paper ticket, and there are all these things on that ticket. Could that information be just included on that ticket? Like as a, you know, asterisk, ability to pay. Here's the website that you go to, call this number. I know that would require the, you know, the police office, there would require yeah. some changes, but could that even be a possibility in your life? It's a great idea. I think the possibilities are endless here, right? Um, but that's a really great idea because it's something tangible that people get. Um, they can read through it or have someone else walk through the, the information with them. They have it right there, right? So I think that's a really great idea. Yeah. If there are no other questions, I want to thank Adrian for coming and speaking with us today. <laughs> Very relevant topic and affects more than that, just those that lose their license. So thank you. Cool. Thanks so much, y'all.